right. Hello, everyone. I believe that we are live. Thanks for being here. Um, today, we're sitting down with Jonathan Williamson. Um, hello, Jonathan. So, Hey, guys. Yeah, pretty excited about this one. All right. Me and him go pretty far back. Hello, everyone. And, I believe uh, that we are live. Thanks for being see. here. I'm stop um, watching the live Today, screen. we're sitting down um, with Jonathan Williamson. Let's see, um, somewhere else I have the stream going, too. All right, cool. Um, excellent. Yeah. Uh, so just to get started, I suppose, I want to introduce him. Um, probably make him blush, but Jonathan Williamson, to me, is like a Blender celebrity. He is a pioneer in the world of uh, Blender education and um, kind of Blender in general. I think everyone would recognize his name. If you've heard Blender, you've heard Jonathan Williamson's name. And um, I look up to the guy tremendously. So big fan of his. It's an honor to work with him. And uh, uh, first thing I wanted to ask him if he would talk about some of his history and how he got into Blender, how he got connected with Wes and therefore CG Cookie, and uh, just kind of what the early days looked like. Um, Jay, would you mind answering that? Yeah, let's do it. Um... Blushing um, commenced. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, well, I'll start with the the easy part, the Blender side. Um, you know, I've been involved with Blender in some form or another since 2003. Uh, I first got started in it because I was I was unschooled at the time. I had a lot of time on my hands. I was um, grew up in the country, and I was really I don't know that I was looking for something to to do, but I was very, I was always curious and I always wanted to, you know, find new things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, a couple years before that, I'd really gotten into, into gaming and computers in general and building my own computers and just basically became completely engrossed in, in tech and, and the arts to a degree. Uh, you know, my, my mom's an artist, my dad's a, a database developer. And so it was kind of, I guess, natural that those kinds of things would appeal to me. Mm -hmm. And a family friend introduced me to Blender. This was like version two, two, five, I think at the time. Uh, so this was, yeah, 2003. And I picked it up for a couple of months, really struggled with it because uh, even, even then the learning flow or the, the learning curve was really, really challenging, way, way worse than it is now. Uh, and so I tried it, gave up. Uh, and kind of just lost track. And then a couple months after that, I picked it up again and never looked back. Um, just got completely engrossed. And basically for a couple of years, I think I spent eight, eight hours a day in Blender, just modeling, rendering, lighting, doing anything and everything that I could just to, I don't know, consume Blender, <laughs> use Blender in more things in my life. And I, I mean, at that point, you know, I, I was 13 when I started. And so I, I think, you know, probably the most exciting and important thing that I could possibly do at that point was create game characters. And so my, my first taste of like actual projects, I suppose, was I got connected with a, a game developer who needed models. And well, I, or at least I thought I knew how to make models. And so I started making some models for him and doing everything from characters to environment assets to weapons and whatnot. And it was, it was totally just, it was for a, um, a mod actually i don't remember what the original game was but it was that first taste of what would it actually be like to work as a game developer or game artist and just do this professionally and i was completely hooked uh and i think at that point i was probably I was 14 maybe 15 uh and i just didn't stop so then i started doing uh blended professionally uh at 16 of sorts oh, when sweet. i did i did a couple of little freelance projects here and there um uh and did my first video tutorial, I think, at, at around that same time and fell in love with teaching. And so then suddenly I had teaching and modeling and Blender all in one. And yeah, that very much led me to here. Um, so quick clarification. You know, um, yeah. I thought you said Blender 2.5 or, or is what you said when you got into Blender, but you don't mean 2.5. No, 2.25. 2. 2. 2.25. Okay, I misheard you. Holy yeah, cow. Yeah. yeah. The dark ages. Uh, it was, bit. Uh, yeah, you could say that. You know, people still kind of freak out at Blender's interface sometimes, and I'm just like, oh my god, you have no idea because <laughs> it's come <laughs> so so far. Uh, wow. So I interrupted yeah, you. So, you said your first tutorial. Oh, that's right. Um, yeah, I did my first tutorial on. Uh, it was modeling the female face. I think it was modeling uh, a human face from references, and it was. 
at the time, that was where I was really focused was basically modeling human heads with good topology. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from day one, the technical side of modeling has always kind of been my the the thing that really interests me. Mm -hmm. um, Any time that I would pick up a project, invariably, my favorite part of the project was always figuring out the technical problems and solving them. And then as soon as I did that, I'd get bored of the project. And then I would pick up another project that needed something else to solve. Um, and so like, I was always very much a technical artist more so than a artist artist. And I think that was part of what really led me to teaching Blender as well, because it was always like, cool, here's a problem. Blender's really, really hard. Blender's really powerful. Blender's available to anyone and everyone. And here's all the things that you want to do with it. So how do you solve the problem of getting past Blender's learning flow or learning curve? Right. And I think that's what kind of sucked me in from the get go. That's really interesting insight. That makes a lot of sense why you've been so successful as a teacher. Whereas I, I come at it more artistic and the I get a kick out of the technical stuff, but it's it's a means to an end. It's almost like the art was a sure. means to the technical end for you. But at the but at the same time, if you compare our portfolios, they're also wildly different. <laughs> and one one is wildly more successful on the art side than no one, and that one is definitely not mine. But the so. gap is not it's not I wouldn't say that that big. So like it's interesting that you've been able to Speak accomplish <laughs> the art side as well as you have, I think. Uh. Um, but I think part of it is just that I absolutely, I really love the art side. Um, yeah. Like, but I don't necessarily love doing it. Okay. I love doing the technical side. That, okay, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Do you think there's anything from that, your like, past, like, um, I know I know that you're into, you know, construction and renovation kind of projects. Did you do that uh, as a kid and, you know, getting yeah. into the walls and the studs and the, you know, uh, electrical work, did that, was that really exciting and... Could that translate into? The oh, I think it absolutely one? translated. Uh, growing up, I didn't find it very exciting because okay. it was, uh, my dad is one of the most independent people I know, okay. and that applies to everything in his life, including doing his own, doing all of his own construction. And so, growing up, we did all of our own construction, whether that was um, uh, framing, drywalling, wiring, plumbing, mm -hmm. you name it. it if it needed to be done, we did it. Uh -huh. uh, and so obviously growing up, that meant learning a lot of different things because we were always very hands-on in that if we had a project, like whether we wanted to be or not, my brother and I were always involved in every single one of those projects. <laughs> Looking back, I'm you know very grateful for that. Growing yeah. up, I was just like, I just want to keep messing in Blender and I don't want to work <laughs> on this stupid project. <laughs> uh, but no, I think that absolutely translates because you know obviously construction and home renovation and uh, you know, any kind of woodworking, they're all very, they have a real creative streak to them, but at its, at its essence, it's technical. Um, yeah, absolutely. you know, if you're, if you're building a chair or you're building a wall, if the technical foundation's not strong, well, it's not going to be very pretty to look at for very yeah. long. Yeah, absolutely. So I keep in right, And you have a very, you have a very strong, um, like do it yourself attitude, don't you? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Hearing you talk like, um, I don't know. I, I just I just see like our our journeys somewhat towards the same thing, but very but slightly different. It, it's interesting to pick up on that. Like the when I think of the, re the re renovation that I do, I get a big kick out of the finishing process. Um, I I respect the walls and what's in the walls, but I don't spend time learning that. <laughs> see, notice, notice how this is not done. Uh, that's indicative of every project that I start for the most part. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I get it all <laughs> built. I mostly finish it. The problems are solved, man. But putting that finishing touch on it is where I tend to not get around to it. You know, when we've worked together in 3D, and I feel like if we did renovation, we'd be a pretty strong team because you have that technical side, and I, I like the finishing and you know art yeah. side a little more. But so this um, is gonna be this is gonna be my secret to finishing projects is I'll build the foundation and then I'll just pass it off to you, and then you can make it all pretty, and it'll be great. I don't mind that one bit. All right, we'll put a pin in that one. <laughs> All right, so for the future. Okay, so I keep interrupting your timeline right. and your history. Um, you uh, left yeah, off with we? just getting started teaching around 16, and what from there? Yeah, from there, um, I continued teaching. Uh, th during high school, I produced, I think it was three different training DVDs um, that then I, I sold through my own shop uh, and kind of started creating creating my own business through that. And did fairly well at it. I don't, you know, I have no idea what the numbers were at this point. But as a high school kid, 
um, you know, I had spending money and that was sweet. Um, <laughs> and it was, it was fun because it gave me a real taste of basically the entire process, hmm. you know, because at that point for better, or for worse, I had no idea what I was doing. Hmm. And so, you know, when I decided to do a, a training course, I was like, well, I want to, you know, this first free tutorial that I did was really well received. I wonder if I can make a business out of that. So, okay, cool. Let's figure out how to turn this into a complete training course. Well, then I've got to learn the screen recording and video encoding. And at that point in time, you know, live streaming and video streaming really were not a thing. Um, believe it or not, when I did my first video tutorial, uh, not be, yeah, be, when I did my first video tutorial, I don't think YouTube, it either didn't exist yet, or it at least hadn't yet been bought by Google. And so it wasn't on anybody's radar. No. And so there was no, there was no video service for uploading your tutorials to. Um, <laughs> so then I had to get a server to actually upload the videos to such that people could either download or embed them and embedding just wasn't really a thing. It just didn't work. Um, you wow. know, at that point, most, most people would have been either on dial up or DSL for the most part. And so nobody had enough bandwidth to stream video anyway. Um, right. and so that's, so I ended up doing the training DVDs cause that was, that was just normal then, you know, yeah. Nobody would really think about doing a DVD at this point, but back then that was the norm. Uh, and so you know, I had to find a DVD printing service, somebody that would actually print the discs, burn the discs. Um, I actually ended up burning all the discs myself because it was cheaper, uh, which, well, I thought it was going to be cheaper <laughs> until I'm sitting there burning, just like on my desktop machine, burning one disc at a time, putting it in, <laughs> reburning it, packaging it up. Uh, wow. I don't think I ever sent anybody a blank disc, but I'm... I was pretty certain it was going to happen. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but then, so, you know, that included, I had to find a way to sell it. Um, and I don't even remember what I used, because I think at that point I was, you know, it was strictly physical. So I was probably doing some kind of WordPress shop, but there weren't very many e-commerce solutions for it. And I actually, to this day, I don't know how I sold it. Um, I know it was through my own site, but I have no idea how people paid me. I don't remember. <laughs> so uh, long I ago. I think it was just a PayPal link, maybe. Right. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, those pages are long, long gone. Wow. Um, but it was fun because it gave me, you know, a real sense of, I guess, a little bit of taste for the entrepreneurial aspect mm -hmm. of business, of creating something that didn't exist, both mm -hmm. on the product side, but also the business side. Right. Um, to my knowledge, I was the first person to sell Blender training outside of the Blender Foundation. Um, oh, wow. you know, they, they had, at the time there was, there was one book on Blender, uh, the Blender 2.2 guide, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, you still have it? I think I do. <laughs> uh, well, if I do, it's not here. I'm pretty certain I have a copy of it somewhere. Um, I just remember I was super excited because I got it signed, Tom signed it, uh, cause I think... <laughs> Uh, I think he signed the first like hundred or something. It's like, all right, I want one right. and no idea where it's at now. Were you interested in Blender when oh, we, like they did a crowdfunding to purchase the software back from I, whatever company? Okay, oh, there this it was is. a 2.3 guide. So this was the one prior to that, but oh, or no. sorry, the one after that. Right. Holy um, yeah, what was your question? Uh, were you around when they crowdfunded to purchase Blender and make it open source from whatever company owned it at the time? No, no. So that was um, that was two thousand one, I okay. think. Yeah, that sounds about right. Right around, right around two thousand. Yeah. Um, and yeah, not a number. The original company had gone bankrupt and then decided to uh, basically pitch it to the community and say, "Hey, can we raise two hundred some thousand euros in order to purchase the?" the rights to the code from the, from the bank because mm -hmm. they, they declared bankruptcy. And so the bank took, you know, oh, yeah. took totally. control of all the assets. Wow. Uh, and it, yeah, I think that was just a couple years before I got involved because that gotcha. were, well, before I found Blender. I right. mean, I didn't actually get involved in Blender as the project mm -hmm. until many years later. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. Um, so when did you join, when did, how did you find Wes? Like when did that connection happen? So that happened, um, it would have been 2008, I think, when we first got connected. Okay. Maybe 2007. Okay. Um, basically, Wes, um, for anybody that's listening that is not aware, Wes is uh, my co-founder. 
So we created CG Cookie. Uh, he created it originally, and then I came on board later. But he created it first as basically a general CG tutorial and new site, um, kind of in the vein of sites like 3D Total and CG Society at that point. You know, they've come a long way since then. But at the time, it was you know CG news, CG tutorials, uh, interviews, job postings, etc. And the idea was just to have a uh, a little site that would enable that. And I think he created it in 2008. If he's in the comments, he can probably correct me, but I'm pretty sure it was 2008. And then he had, he was just basically trying to fund this out of his own pocket to create a site. Cause at the time he was working in game development uh, in downtown Chicago. And so like he had an hour and a half commute each way on the train. And so he would just be working on it each time on the train going to work in the morning and coming home from work late at night. Uh, and he put out a little, I think it was just a little banner ad that was like, Hey, cool. Do you do tutorials? I'll pay you. I'm like, well, I do tutorials. I can do that. And so I sent him an idea and just said, Hey, I'm a blender artist. So I've done a few training here. You can see what I've done. Uh, would you like to pay for a blender tutorial? And his reaction was basically what the hell is blender? <laughs> uh, and he almost rejected it, but thankfully he did not. Uh, and he went ahead and paid me for that. And the rest is history. Uh, basically, that first tutorial did did really well. Um, then we did a second one, and it did really well. And I think it was, you know, within within a month or two months, uh, the Blender tutorials were taking up the bulk of the traffic and driving a whole bunch of new traffic to the site. Oh, and Wes is in the comments. It was September twelfth, two thousand eight, is when CG Cookie was first created online. Um, and so then we just started working together more and more. Still, just. Basically, as as freelancers, you know, we there was no there was no business behind it really. It was just you know, Wes was basically running it as a personal business, and I was then just working as a contractor. Uh, but we started getting very actively involved together, where you know we would start doing freelance projects together. Um, we would talk every single week on basically pitching new training ideas and how to take the training up a notch, how to make it a little bit more serious. Um, and that really kind of culminated in what became our, our Blender 2.5 training series. And that was, uh, that would have been mid 2009, I think it was. Mm -hmm. That um, sounds about right. But it was basically like Blender 2.5 was in development. Uh, it wasn't released yet. Like you could, you could play with the development builds, but it was not production ready by any means. And we basically decided, hey, we want to release the first training series for Blender 2.5, the moment it comes out. And we didn't know when it was gonna come out, you know, as with any production project, it's always like, cool, it'll be out next month. It'll be out next month. Right. Six months later, it'll be out next month. Right. Uh, so we took, we we created a, a landing page for it, created some fun graphics. Uh, I wrote the outline and basically the intention was to teach everything. And Kent, you'll appreciate this considering how many courses you and I have both done and realize how overly ambitious this was. Yeah. But we were basically like, cool, we're going to create an entire character and we're going to teach everybody the basics. We're going to teach them the modeling, the texturing, the lighting, the compositing, the animation, the rigging. We're going to teach everything. <laughs> or more correctly, I'm going to teach everything. Right. <laughs> and it was it was the worst idea ever. <laughs> uh, because particularly because we committed to it and then started taking pre-orders before 2.5 was available, much less before we had an even, a single second of training recorded. Uh, Did you advertise that you were going to teach everything? Yeah, and that that was that was the mistake. <laughs> we should never have done that. Ballsy! Uh, that, wow. Yeah. Uh, so it was. I don't remember how long it ended up being, but it actually is what became the the Kara series. Yeah. Uh, where David David Robaw did the the character concept art, and then I did all the modeling and everything past that. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think that it was it was one of those, we, we had no idea what to expect. So we put up the, the pre-orders page and we, I don't remember how many we sold that night, but originally it was gonna be cool. The first 25 orders get a free t-shirt as well. And mm -hmm. we're like, yeah, you know, so maybe we'll, you know, here in a couple of weeks, maybe we'll sell out of pre-orders and then we'll go from there. And we turned it on at like 10 o'clock at night woke up the next morning and there were like 35 pre-orders um Holy and God. we didn't we didn't have that many shirts uh we didn't have the money to buy those shirts <laughs> <laughs> uh luckily we, we were taking pre-orders and so then suddenly we had a little bit more cash uh and then really that that was what led to cg cookie as it became okay. because it 
it proved to us that there was a viable market for dedicated blender training mm -hmm. and dedicated training on a large scale. Because at that point, all of the tutorials that I had done up to that point and all the other tutorials that were available, which was not very many, um, it would be like a single tutorial on a short subject. So like, I remember a couple of the original ones I made, uh, one was like rigging a hydraulic cylinder, uh, mm -hmm. modeling a steampunk telescope, um, uh, UV unwrapping a face. Mm -hmm. uh, like they were very specific and either had a single topic or a single subject that they were covering. Right. And most of them would have been like 30 minutes. And yeah. suddenly we were saying, hey, we're gonna create a 30 hour long training course and we're gonna sell it to you. Will you buy it? And people did. Um, wow. And then it continued to be on pre-order for like a year and a half because Blender 2.5 took a really, really long time. <laughs> right. So when you were recording that, did you find like, like almost show stopping bugs or, you know, cause at that point it had to be buggy. I don't think so. Um, I mean, I was probably fortunate that the most of what I was doing within the course was still modeling, um, modeling and UVs and whatnot. And so that was all fairly stable. Hmm. Uh, I think it was, had we been doing substantial animation and whatnot, that probably would have been an issue, okay. you know, cause those were big sections of 2.5 that got completely rewritten and whatnot. So, right. Yeah. I don't remember running into showstoppers. I think at that point it was the, the showstoppers honestly were that, um, I really hope that you still have trust in us because we took your money a year ago and you still don't have your product. Holy cow, a yeah, year. That, that, wow. It was, it was about a year and a half, I think, from the time that we started pre-orders to actually delivering the, the training. Unbelievable. And <laughs> Worked out. People, people are awesome. <laughs> because, <laughs> holy cow. Right. You know, I mean, like, we, we started the pre-order with the intention of it being released in a month. And that was a very ignorant mistake. So then so. I'm curious, what did you do? Did you just continue making 2.49 tutorials in that year? I don't remember. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I actually have no idea. I think so. Um, you know, I think I'd done a couple of little tutorials showing like 2.5 as it was coming up. Uh, but I think mostly it was 2.4. Okay. Because uh, then it, at some point in that process, we like made a public announcement that we will only be doing 2.5 tutorials from here on out. Mm -hmm. And I remember it being a little bit of a big deal just okay. because not everybody was convinced that 2.5 was the right move yet. Um, okay. But, and I don't know if that was a blog post or an email. I don't remember what that was, but right. yeah. Okay. Also for me to frame, this wasn't your full time um, income at this point. It was on the side still, right? A little bit of both, okay. um, you know, so like Wes and I started working together um, in the basic sense, you know, in 2008, 2009, I think it was late 2008. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was a, I think I was a freshman at Kansas State University. Okay. And I had just gotten a, I'd gotten a little part-time job at a media center there on campus. Uh, so I was working at the media lab uh, about 15 hours a week. Uh, and then the rest was either blender training, like doing CG cookie stuff. Uh, and then I was doing freelance projects here and there on the side. So it wasn't, it wasn't my full time, but it was definitely the bulk of my income because mm -hmm. being a college kid with student loans. Um, I, well, looking back, I would have loved to have more income because I could have just not had student loans and that would have been great. Uh, <laughs> but you know, at the time you don't really think about it and like, Hey, yeah, I'm spending money. Sweet. Right. Uh, Right. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. But but then I qu I quit the media lab like six months later, uh, gotcha. and at that point, CGP was the only thing I did. Okay. Wow. For the most part, like I still did, I still did freelance projects, but the bulk of my time was spent on CGP. Right. Okay. Yeah. So then, follow up question to that: yeah. um, People who have been around our site for the last couple of years may have noticed that you haven't made a ton of training um, in the last. Two, is it it's only two or is it three years at this point probably more like three okay um yeah i mean the last the last training course that i released would have been the rutopo flow one um mm -hmm. and prior to that uh probably the mesh modeling fund or no modeling with modifiers i think was yeah. the last course that i did okay uh you haven't gone cold uh, turkey but just sprinkled here and there so 
then yeah. like uh, tell us about that. Like what what why the stoppage of of education production, and then like sure. what did you do? Like where did you where were your interests put um, besides? So that? I think it's kind of twofold, you know, because basically. I, yeah, about three years ago was when I stopped or started basically trying to transition away from training as the core focus of my work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would have, you know, I, like, like we just mentioned, you know, I did a couple more courses in that time frame, but for the most part, I have stopped doing training. Mm -hmm. um, and mostly it's, it's two reasons. One was burnout um, in that I, basically I had been doing training since I was 16, uh, mm -hmm. I'm 28 now. And so, yeah, I'd been doing it for, was it eight year, eight, nine years at that time? Mm -hmm. um, pretty much full time, like that was the thing that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was ready for something different, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I still love training mm -hmm. with, without a doubt, still have a deep passion for it. The other, the other and perhaps more important aspect of why I started transitioning away from training was uh, I had to focus on the business. And, you know, Wes and I are absolutely partners in this. And so, you know, the way that it's, the way that it's basically work or the, the way we've kind of grown into our roles, because CG Cookie was effectively an accidental business. You know, <laughs> Wes intentionally set out to create this, this little thing, mm -hmm. but really didn't know what it was going to become. And so it's accidental in the sense that what it is now, there was never a business plan. There was never an outline. There was never a strategy for, hey, five years from now, we want to have a subscription service that will offer, you know, weekly training releases with a dedicated team, you know, et cetera. None of that. Like it was, it's been truly organic. And so one of the things that was also organic was that we organically became partners in this venture. Mm -hmm. uh, and in doing that, you know, we both try and try and do, take care of our own responsibilities. And in the last couple of years, we've gotten a lot better at basically um, divvying up the work in the sense of, you know, Wes is basically transitioning into, and particularly within this last month or so, as you'll be well aware, mm -hmm. um, he's transitioning much more into the CEO role. I'm much more into the, it, uh, technically I'm COO, so chief operating officer. Mm -hmm. um, but what that really means is basically I'm focused internally on the business. Wes is focused externally on the business. Uh, and it's really hard to continue doing that to the full extent that needs to be done while mm -hmm. also producing the content. You know, right. since since obviously CG Cookie is built around content and community and things like that, the content is king. Mm -hmm. But if if I'm spending all my time creating content, I don't have any time to then focus on growing how we work as a company, what we're actually doing, and how we go about that. Right. Um, the other the other big part of that is that three years ago we launched the Blender Market, and the Blender Market. Um, is you know it's been a slow and steady project but it's just progressively taken more and more and more of my time to the point that now you know the the hope is to basically have me focused almost exclusively on the market where you know that's basically my role is build and grow the market and you know make it into a truly sustainable business mm -hmm. uh, and that it it kept it kept getting to the point where well, while the training was important and obviously content is king, it was really hard to continue to separate or like, I don't know, have the mental energy to do both. Yeah. Uh, so. Absolutely. Very long-winded, rambly answer to your no, question. No, that was perfect. No, yeah, <laughs> that was great. Um, I guess also in that time, in that span, you started to focus on Retoboflow, which has taken, mm -hmm. I mean, you've done several updates, several development sprints. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, you kind of maybe pre-explained your interest in the technical side, but was that something that you'd been wanting to do for a while and the education kind of prevented you from focusing on that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was something I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, for Tobaflow, the retopology add-on. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I don't know that it was so much that the education specifically prevented me from doing that, but basically something had to give, mm -hmm. you know, because at the time, you know, I was trying to basically juggle um, gr growing the business with Wes, mm -hmm. building and designing Retopaflow and coordinating that project, mm -hmm. building and growing the Blender market with Retopaflow as the, the test case, producing training. Uh, and uh, oh, at the time, I was also um, trying to be very heavily involved in Blender as the project as one of the UI leads and doing more and more 
Blender development and like coordination and design within Blender's the project. And so there was five very big things that yeah. I, I I just couldn't I, I couldn't keep up with it. Um, right. I you know I I didn't have the the mental energy to to give all five of those projects the time that they needed. Yeah. Um, much less the time that I wanted to give them because you know what was starting to happen was all of my projects or all of my focuses were suffering both in like my own satisfaction with them but also just the actual quality of them because i couldn't give any of them the time they were due right and so something had to give and yeah absolutely that was training. <laughs> right and if i recall the um the workshop that you did around that that time that was a that was a big thing to take on yeah that was that was kind of a, a catalyst of sorts for realizing that I had to I had to make a change and kind of step away a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because we that that workshop was 2000. It had to be 14. Tw no, no, no. 12, right? 12 or 13. No, wait, really? OK, not 12. I'm wrong about that. 13. Oh, yeah. No, oh, no, maybe no it was you're right. You're right, because I was living in Chicago at the time. And so it would have been, yeah, 2012. Holy cow. Oh, is it um, that far back? Okay. Uh, I guess so. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, that workshop, you know, since it was a, it was a live workshop given, well, not a live workshop. It was a pre-recorded workshop with live events, uh, live Q&As every single week with something like 30 some hours of dedicated training. Um, and then I had, I think it was 70 students in total with 30 of them. Um, having paid for basically personal one-on-one -on -one sessions um, or personal one-on-one -on -one feedback every single week for five weeks straight. And, oh, <laughs> I mean, I loved the project and I thought the outcome was good. It was, it was so overly ambitious. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I didn't have any, I didn't have anything left after that. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. I mean, we... I've ran a couple since then and picked up some very key points from what you learned there, especially with the number of seats, the number of people to, to take yeah. on. Yeah. It's a big thing. It, um, it was, that was tough. Uh, I mean, I think it, looking back, it did really well and it, we, we really learned a lot from it. Mm -hmm. Um, and particularly learned some things not to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, that was <laughs> memorable. Right. Right. Um, so then a question coming off of that training and you talked about burnout, um, did, did that span that you said like from 16 to were you like 24 at that time when you maybe stopped? Uh, yeah, I would have been, I would have been about 25, 26 when I really kind of stopped training okay. because it would have been, um, basically, you know, six months after the C2 cookie five release, I think. Okay. Okay, or four. Right around there. And granted, I, I guess it's a little harder to put a put a date on it just since it's been such a gradual transition off. Right. You know, it wasn't like, you know, woke up January 1st, like, all right, done. I'm not doing any more training. Yeah, uh, right. I'm with you. I may have, I may have, you know, told myself that, but. Right. I, so about 10 yeah. years then of like nonstop training, creating training. So what has that done to your like affection for 3D in general? Like. Um, I can, I can relate to you in this, in that, like, I don't do any, I haven't done a personal 3d project in probably years. Mm. What about you? Like, do you find yourself doing enjoy, enjoyable 3d stuff in free time? Every once in a blue moon. Okay. Um, and I'd say that it's, I don't know that training has lessened my love for 3d. Mm -hmm. I think just like anything, when you do it for a living, do anything for a living long enough, it's hard to enjoy continuing to do that thing in your, in your spare time. Right. When, you know, in 12 hours, you've got to wake up and continue doing it professionally again. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know that that would have been any different mm -hmm. had, you know, were I say a production artist or a developer, anything. Yeah. I think just the, the mere act of, you know, doing 3D professionally in some capacity for so long, I I want nothing to do with it in my spare time. Basically. <laughs> right. uh, and in, mostly in the sense that I, just, I need a break. Yeah. And so anymore, you know, and this this applies to computers too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't play computer games. 
Um, uh-huh. As in, like, I don't play on a PC. Yeah. I play I play video games exclusively on consoles mm-hmm. because it's separate from my workstation. Right. Like my I, I play on Xbox mostly, and so my Xbox is in my living room. Mm-hmm. Um, it's away from my computer. It's not attached to my work, and so it's a complete change of scenery and change of mental space that for me is necessary to enjoy it. Right. Um, every now and then I'll play like civilization on my laptop. And even then, like, it feels like I should be working because I work on my laptop. <laughs> and so, yeah, no. I think that's been a big part of it. It's just the, the mental switch yeah. of just getting to, you know, fill my day with something other than, than 3d. Definitely. Uh, and I think that would be the case if, you know, no matter what I did. Yeah. Yeah. That makes that makes total sense. Um, and you like, I mean, you get married, you have other responsibilities, like just things yeah. in life that I think, like you said, that's a much more normal progression to work. I think from coming from school, there was such like a pure enjoyment of 3D that mm-hmm. it lasted through uh, probably the first three years of being a professional 3D artist. I would still come home and like want to do personal projects. And then I look at like a Tim who can draw forever day in and yeah. day out for work outside of work and i'm like that i used to be that and now i've kind of lost a part of it but i think he's probably just the exception that kind of pure so. love of 3d or, i mean it's always possible that he's just not there yet but right i, I think you're probably right. he's just the exception that he's just he's just so involved in his drawing that you know as long as he's drawing he's happy right um, right and you know i was i was the same way with 3d similar to you Probably up in up into my early twenties, okay. um, you know, it would have been, you know, admittedly, it's probably about when I got married that I stopped doing three D for fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah, that makes sounds about right. Perfect anyway. sense. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I want to spend time with my wife when I'm yeah. not working. <laughs> so why would I be working in front of the computer all the time when I'm right. not working? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it, it, it's one of those kind of somber realities and it really shouldn't be because like hanging out with your wife my family like that's satisfying you know almost incomparably but like okay. when i'm in 3d like at the at my office or my, at my desk all the time like i just feel like get into the purity of 3d and enjoy this thing so it's kind of sad that I used to have it and don't anymore but anyway. yeah um all right so so then you talked about we well we we've, we've talked a little about about things taking our time. What do you do in your free time that's not 3D? What other like hobbies, outlets? What do you enjoy doing? Um I really have I have two mostly. Okay. Uh I mean that's not totally true. I have two that I actively do on a regular basis and that is running and home brewing. Um okay. so last couple of years I um, have really gotten back into running, um, both as a fitness thing, but mostly as a, I don't, I don't want to say escape because that makes it sound really negative because uh-huh. it's not like I'm trying to escape from anything, <laughs> right. but going for a long run, um, I'm mostly a distance runner, um, okay. and going for a long run is, it's really, it's peaceful. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great way to just kind of, you know, relieve yourself of, the burdens of the day, the week, the month, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just, just spend some time in your head. Mm-hmm. Uh, like for me, I, Oh, if I'm trying to do a fast run, I'll, I'll run with music, but oftentimes I run in silence. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's something really therapeutic about that. Wow. Uh, so I'll, I've been doing that a lot. And you know, some days I'm, some days I go for a run because maybe it's, I've had a stressful day and I said, screw it. I got to get out. I gotta go. <laughs> uh, other days, you know, like if I have a, a long weekend or something like that, I'll just go for a long run just to enjoy it. Uh, wow. But then the other thing is I'm I'm brewing a lot, brewing a lot of beer. Okay. Uh, so I'm a I'm an avid home brewer, mostly brewing uh, sour and wild ales, as they're typically called, <laughs> which basically means I'm doing slow uh, mixed fermentation beers that take anywhere from like three to twelve months. They're they're often brewed in an oak barrel and will sit in in an oak barrel for quite a while, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's kind of a it's a nice creative outlet, which mm-hmm. also, you know, like most things that I enjoy, has a has a real technical streak to it, mm-hmm. but plenty of room for creative expression. Yeah. Uh, and so the you know the creative part, just like in cooking, comes in the the recipe execution. You know, what's it what's it taste like? What's it look like? Right. Uh, what ingredients did you use? How did you use it? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then of course there's the technical aspect of 
you know, yeast and bacteria are living microorganisms and they need, they need to be sustained. You've got to feed them well, you've got to give them the right environment and uh, yeah, all of those things. Right. Um, I think oh, Jonathan Miller just said, I love a good mead. Uh, I have made one mead and it was terrible, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would like to try again for sure. <laughs> So what's I've got, a mead? I've got some friends that make them. Uh, mead is a basically fermented honey, uh, fermented honey, and oftentimes mixed with water. You know, you wouldn't necessarily ferment just straight honey. Okay. So a lot of times, you know, depending on how strong you want to make it, you might do like fifty percent water, fifty percent honey. Oh, wow. um, just depends on what you're going for. Right. Um, so it's, it's a much simpler beverage generally from the ingredient standpoint. Okay. Uh, but it can be just as complex, just as interesting. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Nice. So and it's what, nice because completely away from the digital world. Yes. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so when we went a couple years ago to uh, the place in Geneva, what was the what's the name of that? Um, uh, Penrose. Penrose yeah, Penrose. Um, was that like a, had you decided before then uh, to, that you were going to get into brewing? I remember that being like eye opening for me to the science and art of brewing. Was that similar for you? It was close. I think at that point, I think I had just recently started home brewing. Okay. And so I knew a little bit about it in terms of what, you know, what was going on, how it was working. But it was it was eye opening and, and exciting to see somebody basically starting out and doing it so well mm -hmm. um, from the get go. And, and they're still there. They're um, they're still there in in Geneva, Illinois, outside of Chicago, mm -hmm. um, still I, I just brought back a couple of bottles uh, oh, when nice. we were there in Chicago last week. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're, they're fantastic. That was an awesome experience. Yeah. Um, they, I think that was the first time that I'd ever been like actually on a brewery tour of sorts. And okay. the first time that, you know, the business side was kind of like they opened the gates and just said, cool, you know, ask us questions like here's how our process works. Right. And I had never been exposed to that part of the, the brewing world. So gotcha. that was definitely Okay. I mean, cool. Yeah, that was a fantastic experience. Yeah, um, I really liked that. Speaking of Geneva, we're coming back. Last week, all of us were uh, at, at a retreat, as we call them, where we all physically get together since we're all remote um, uh, the rest of the time. Um, and so coming off of that, we talk a lot about CG Cookie, almost entirely about CG Cookie, where it's going, what, how we can improve um, – um, so with that, like, can you talk about where you imagine CG Cookie going in the near future, in the distant future? Yeah, you're asking the hard questions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or we can start simpler. Like, what were your favorite parts about the retreat? How about that? You know, I think as a remote company, um, particularly a remote company filled with people that all really like other people, mm -hmm. um, even though we're mostly introverts, we still, we, we all like, like each other and yeah. enjoy spending time together. Mm -hmm. Um, or at least speaking for myself, I enjoy spending time with all you guys. <laughs> I hate it personally, uh, but that's all right. Oh, oh man. <laughs> uh, so that's, what, that's probably the, you know, my favorite aspect of it is there's a being remote, you know, cause we've got, you know, members of the team that are in, you know, we're all in different States in several different countries. We're, we're all over the world. And so, I think just the the opportunity to spend some time together and like have the I hate to call them brainstorming sessions, but really that's kind of what it is. It's that that moment of just spontaneity that is really hard to capture in a remote workplace. Right. Um, you know, like that when you're when you're just working and then somebody has a great idea and you then just hash it out and talk about it for the next hour and a half because you all get excited. Mm hmm that's really hard to do remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that being said, I think, I think some of that happens because we're remote. And so we're not just basically tired of putting up with each other every single day. Right. <laughs> um, and so when we do get together, there's, there's a lot of energy and, mm -hmm. you know, everybody's excited and it's great. Yes. Uh, you know, whether, whether you could replicate that on a day-to-day, day-to-day ba day -day basis, if we were all in the same room every single day. True. I, I, I don't know. Um, right. So that's always my favorite part. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, like you alluded to, you know, one of the things that we do at these retreats is, it's really just basically try and set, set the trajectory of where we want to take CG Cookie, mm -hmm. uh, where do we want to take it next year? Where do we want to take it a few years from now? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've never done much in the way of 
goals or forecasting or, you know, being like 10 years from now, you know, we want to be X, but we're trying to maybe do a little bit more of that just as far as, you know, what's the direction we're going, Mm -hmm. you know, what, what do we, what do we want to change in the company and our products, our services, ourselves that five years from now, we'll be really happy we did. And maybe that we would be unhappy if we didn't change. Yeah. Um, And I think, you know, for me, one of the big things is finding a way to basically really engage, um, basically serious, dedicated users, you know, people that are really passionate about getting into 3D, getting into game development to help give them a platform for success, Mm -hmm. where right now we really kind of cater to everyone. You know, if you have, if you have an interest in 3D and game development and concept art, we cater to you. Um, and I think that's great, but I think it's, it comes at the, the sacrifice of the really basically the more dedicated users. And at least for us, we can give, particularly being a small team, being a remote team, we can give a far better experience, I think, to a few people than to a lot of people. And, you know, cause kind of the same issue that we started running into, like with me on training, I was getting spread too thin. Mm-hmm. I was getting spread too thin across all these other projects. And so something had to give. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I think that our basically CG cookie as a whole is kind of at that point of where we're, we're basically doing too much for too many people. And if we could instead focus in on, I don't know, a, a smaller subset of people, I think we could give a far better experience for those people. Yeah. Um, and so how, you know, basically finding ways to, to raise that bar and to focus more, to give people, give people more, but make it more worthwhile. Right. So, um, yes, that is Melvin back there (laughs) next to a (laughs) Moomin. Sorry. I just saw the comment come through the question. Is that the the Melvin that was, uh, custom made by somebody West knows? It was, uh, one sec. This thing's awesome. Um, yeah. So I'd have to, um, if Wes is in the chat, he can probably, uh, explain a little bit more, but basically, so Melvin was one of our characters in, Eat Sheep, the game that we made, oh, I don't even know how long ago that was, um, six years ago, seven years ago. Yeah. Uh, and then he got, Wes got, found somebody on Etsy, I think, that was doing custom plushies. And so then she made uh, four or five of them, I think. Uh, and yeah, they're they're really great. He's, he survived one dog um, and oh, barely. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, oh my, wow! When your dog started to husky, grabbed him one time and was very excited to have a new chew, chew toy. <laughs> uh, and luckily, I was in the room because wow, wow. Melvin would not be here otherwise. Right. right. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, if Wes is listening, I'd love to see if that that person is still on Etsy because she really did a great job. Um, uh, I, I couldn't she, believe how well she modeled it with fabric. Like, yeah, I don't know how you do that. The forms and she just totally nailed it. I mean, doing this in three D is easy. Doing this in fabric? Seriously? I know, yeah. That completely. Well, and, and doing it from just a photo. Oh, you know, do we not, not even like give we, her a it's turnaround? Not like we, uh, no, I mean, we probably did, but okay. still, how you... I mean, think think of trying to take, like, I'm going to give you a UV map, now build your model off of that. Oh, yeah. So, oh, I don't wow. know how you do that. What it. a talent. So, Man. So, yeah, uh, um, that was really cool. So, going back to what you were saying about focusing on you know, the really dedicated users. Um, I can, it resonated with me talking a lot about that at the retreat, that it can start to threaten, it feel like it threatens like our mission of making, enabling artists to be successful. And um, especially with Blender being our primary kind of uh, demographic. And that, I don't know, that 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 did put me, um, you know, cause there's the, the, there's a part of me that's like, Blender's amazing. So like becoming a, an instructor, is like, I can teach people why it's amazing and Blender can grow in a sense. And so there's this element of me that as a business, I would love to like convince the world. And I have a personal experience from like professional colleagues who like give me the weird eye when I tell them and I show them that I use Blender. So like partly the more people, the better, like let's convince more and more people. Um, But yeah, in the last couple of years, definitely feeling that that hurts our ability to focus on the people who, who really are trying and really get what we do. And, totally. and well, really and I think it's, it. it's, you know, it's, it's hard because you, I mean, you brought up a really good point that is 
you know, to a certain degree, it's almost like, you know, we want to help. Um, this, this is going to sound very sales pitchy. It's not intended that way. I just can't think of another way to put it. Uh, it's almost like we want to help Blender democratize 3D or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, that there's absolutely a role for that. And I think that for a long time, that really was kind of, kind of where we were, you know, for one, going back, you know, a few years, five years, 10 years, whatever, um, Blender had a very different, um, perception than it does now. Mm -hmm. You know, it had a, it had a real black sheep reputation for a very long time. And, you know, it's still kind of getting past that reputation. And so for a while there, it really was kind of a, Hey, we want to, we want to grow Blender and subsequently our user base, our customer base as much as we can mm -hmm. every single day by, you know, teaching Blender, making it more widely available, helping people get over the learning curve. But I think there's a fair argument to be made that we're past that point, um, mm -hmm. you know, both as a company, but also as a just as Blender as a whole, mm -hmm. you know, at this point in time, it is without a doubt the single most used 3D application in the world That's by awesome. a long shot. Um, you know, at least so far as the number of people using it, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard to say, you know, how the number of people using it professionally, but absolutely based on number of users, it's, it's not even close. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sp sp spreading the word of Blender uh, <laughs> doesn't, doesn't really, doesn't really apply anymore. Uh, mm -hmm. Not, not in the way that it used to. Right. And I think that even if that were our focus still, there'd be different avenues that we could do that than training. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, on the training side, the, the more we try and, you know, grow, grow, grow as far as users and reach and whatnot, the thinner we get. Uh, right. And that, you know, everybody suffers when that's the case. Right. Uh, Very true. And, and part of that is just the, the way that we've designed CG Cookie, CG Cookie as, a, as a service. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the comparison that I would make would be, think of like, uh, was it codeschool.com um, and like code.org, mm -hmm. where their, their sole mission is basically to teach people programming and to teach as many people programming as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And so they really, they do two things, basically. They, they teach, well, not really two things. They basically have one or two primary courses. Mm -hmm. And that was it for the longest time. I mean, I know that they have a lot more now, but like codeschool.com, which is where I originally learned Python. Yeah. Um, for like five years, they had one course right. per programming language. They had one Python course. They had one Ruby course. That was it. There, there was nowhere to ask questions. There was no, you know, instructor involvement mm -hmm. because for one, they, they weren't video lessons. They were literally text lessons that had a web, um, console built in so that you could write your your Python scripts directly in the browser. You could compile them or run them uh, in the browser. And so there was no personal involvement. It was basically just you and the technology, right. which was really, really cool. Uh -huh. That's not what we are, you know, right. and being being so art heavy on on the 3D side and the game dev side, I'm not sure that we could be there even if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like going back to what you said, where where we really want to be able to you know, be an alternative to, to art school. Hmm. You don't have art schools, successful ones where you've got, you know, a thousand to one, uh, student to teacher ratio. It doesn't <laughs> sure. happen because you can't, you can't a answer that many questions in an involved way and actually give people guidance right. before long. You're just like, yeah, go over here. You right. go over there you, right. and it doesn't really work anymore. Right. Uh, so it seems to me like particularly from from last week at a retreat that we're definitely kind of moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I guess if I were to go back to your original question, where do where do I see us mm -hmm. in in a few years? It would be I would see CG Cookie being a a stronger personal focused on the artist than rather than a wide and uh, shallow focus. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm with going, you. Now. Going for over breadth. Or yeah, absolutely. Quality over quantity. Right. Uh, so we'll take a quick rabbit trail. Got a couple questions. Yeah. Did you see those too? Uh, yeah, go for it. Um, um, so, I think there's a couple at the bottom too. If we want to just go from the bottom up. Oh yeah, let's see. I was keeping an eye on them. I'm trying to see where the other right, ones. I thought are. I saw a couple questions. Let's see. Let's see. 
I'll ask you the one from Dor Diskin. Dor Dore Diskin. Okay. Um, so how do you work when your computer available is a very low grade? Work with Blender, I assume. Do you have any tips for that? Um, yeah, I mean, one is, you know, treat it as a constraint. You know, we we all have to learn to work with constraints. Um, and in my opinion, that's typically a very good thing. Uh, constraints are great because they, they limit your scope. You know, if if I handed you a, you know, a fifteen thousand dollar computer with the most RAM and processing speed available mm -hmm. that could sculpt, you know, trillions of polygons, would that improve your sculpt? No, it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to get more detail? Sure. But detail is not your answer. Right. Um, and so if you have a low grade machine, figure out how you can work with that machine, given the constraints. So, for example, you know, one of the things that becomes very challenging with a lower grade machine is sculpting. Mm -hmm. So what if you didn't sculpt? What if what if you used the sculpting tools merely as a way to capture form, but not in detail? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that could be embracing low poly art. That could be, um, you know, focusing on silhouettes. That could be, uh, it could be Python scripting. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe if you're a more technical artist, start looking at at abstract art and the ways that you can generate the art um through your python scripting mm -hmm. uh it could be you know it could be any number of things but basically understand that that is a constraint but that doesn't have to be a roadblock it doesn't have to stop you uh you know so long assuming that this is in the context of, of blender um as long as the machine can run blender and you can you know operate all of its functions there's there's nothing to stop you right um just know that there, there are going to be some things that you can do or cannot do uh just in the same way that you know for uh, well, like think about this way: like if you're if you're a traveling artist, and let's say you're you're literally working out of a van, mm -hmm. oil painting is probably not going to be a good choice for you because <laughs> oil paints take forever to dry, and suddenly you're going to be out of physical room to store your paintings while they dry. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you're going to stop painting, right? So yeah, I think that's probably the best answer beyond just you got to buy a, a better computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, and, and and. A better computer will never improve your art. Yes. It will just improve your ability to output art. Right. To riff off and of maybe, you. And maybe the... improve your enjoyment during that, but you know, it's <laughs> yeah, nice it's when you don't true. have to wait for things. Very true. To riff off of you and the constraint, I don't think I ever really appreciated that principle um, until getting into game dev recently, like with the team and, you know, kind of a focus for the team on, on game dev. Uh -huh. But like trying to shrink everything into polygons, like constraints basically – um, for performance has been so much fun. And I was really surprised fun? by how much fun it is. See, and that, that goes back to like the technical aspect that I love so much. Cause it's suddenly like, Hey, we have this thing and it won't run <laughs> because there is too much going on. Okay. Right. Let's, let's fix this. So right. like, there's a problem to solve. And like, oh, maybe absolutely. I just like solving problems. Absolutely. Um, a couple other questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to combine a couple. It's, do you plan to make more character modeling tutorials or vehicles? And then I'm going to combine that with Omar's question. Um, we've been focusing on the basics. Do we plan on doing more advanced tutorials soon? Sure. Um, um, go, go for it. No, you go ahead. We will absolutely do more character and vehicle tutorials in some form. Whether I will, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. Probably not. Um, probably not for me personally. Not that I won't do more tutorials at some point, but... You know, particularly in in the context of like characters and vehicles, I'm I'm not the right person to do it anymore. You know, mm -hmm. Kent, your modeling skills are far beyond what mine will will ever be, mm -hmm. and so I'm no longer. You know, it doesn't make sense for me to do those when people like you, Lamp Jonathan Lampell, and other people are doing just as good work mm -hmm. and better. Mm -hmm. um, where where I might do more training though, um, you know, because I like I said in the beginning, like I still I love training, I really do. Um, is I want to do more training to introduce other concepts, um, you know, whether that is um, Python scripting for artists is something I would really love to to revisit. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I'd love to start doing um, more non art training, and in, in the sense of you know, basically kind of on the business side, mm -hmm. you know, with one of our goals has always been 
uh, even though I don't know that we really realized this was the case until a few years ago, but at least for the last few years, we've had a real focus on trying to enable people to succeed as independent artists, mm -hmm. um, particularly with Blender, but also with Unity and, and all the other tools around those. And I would love to start doing, you know, whether they're workshops, courses, you know, whatever format they take, basically share more of what we've learned throughout all of this process mm -hmm. to help other people. So, you know, that could be a, a course on freelancing. It could be a course on business discipline, it, mm -hmm. you know, anything and everything. So definitely. I want, I want to do more training. Yeah. And just where that training happens and what it'll be on. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I like, yeah, I like that you're open to it at least very, very much though. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you said there was a, Oh, the second half of that question was then, um, will there be more advanced training? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Omar, I think, uh, it was, yeah, it was Omar that asked this. Um, I think that absolutely applies to the, you know, the quality argument, you know, going for quality over quantity. And that if we are to give people a really focused experience and education that really enables them to succeed, we have to do more advanced training. Mm -hmm. But, um, I'll preface that with, you know, a little bit of, a little bit of history. So we started CG cookie, basically doing anything and everything. If it was an interesting topic in blender, we did it, you know, whether that was modeling a steampunk telescope, whether that was rigging train wheels, whether that was, um, you know, a simulation of falling buttons, didn't matter if it was interesting, we did it. Mm -hmm. And that was fun. It got us a long ways. But then when we launched CG cookie five, a couple years ago, we moved our focus to the beginners to basically with the understanding that, you know, we, we were starting to, we were at a, a hard point in CG Cookie's history and that we were, we'd been doing really, really well for four or five years. And then basically we were, we were stagnating. We were burning out as a team. Um, it was just something had to give. And so one of the things that we did is we refocused a lot of our training on beginners saying, let's start by building a core curriculum of the fu fundamentals for each of the key areas that we teach such that everybody coming in can have the same baseline because we over and over and over again, we would have problems of somebody would want to, would come into say like an advanced character modeling course and then get so frustrated because they didn't have any of the fundamentals. So we basically took the, the university approach says, look, if you want to learn this, you need to learn the fundamentals first. You know, you can skip ahead if you want, but here's the fundamentals that you need to know before you can really excel. Um, and I think we've done that pretty well. What, the next step in that though, is then building continuously on top of those fundamentals. You know, we spent the last year and a half, two years or whatever it is doing almost nothing but beginner tutorials. Mm -hmm. And obviously there are plenty of people within CG cookie that are no longer beginners. And so, you know, those people kind of lose out a little bit. Um, Omar, I know for a fact that you're kind of one of them. Um, and so going back to that idea of really trying to limit our scope and focus on the, you know, a thorough advanced experience or no, sorry, not an advanced experience, a, um, a really top notch experience for a smaller group of users. We want to start building more advanced courses on top of those fundamentals. And that I think has been the key difference because previously it was like, Hey, here's an advanced tutorial. Oh, what do you need to know before doing that tutorial? Uh, maybe this, 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 and go over there and do something else. <laughs> you know, it was very, it was very haphazard. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we've got the actual structure and the foundation built that we can do the advanced stuff. Yeah. Um, so yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, just now we want to do it right as opposed to haphazard. Yes, absolutely. It's a good way to answer it. Um, coming from still, you know, someone um, very active in the in the content creation part of our company. Um, specifically, we don't have any vehicle tutorials planned. Um, I'm going to continue our character modeling for game course with the robot and to the texturing and shading side. Um, also, Lampel is going to um, continue his weapons with the texturing and shading of that as well. Um, and so those are coming. But then beyond that, we're trying to think a little bit bigger about how can we, um, for a long time, you know, we, we heard a lot of when's more courses, like when are more modeling character modeling vehicle courses coming. And that, be that has become quite a burden because at this point, I'm like, I, if I teach another character course, it, it's nothing that I haven't already taught. It, it becomes like a big production all to just change like the face of the course, like the, the featured image and like the, the 
images itself, the subject, um, the type of character. Yes. And, um, and so, but, but then when we taught like a workshop, I loved that. That to me was a, was a big experience because it was a character workshop and there were videos to watch, but like me being personally active throughout that entire five week process, um, you could pick your own character and, and like very applicably put that knowledge onto something that you wanted, which is what I feel like people are asking. Are you going to make more vehicle tutorials? Because yeah, this vehicle is less interesting and I want to, I want another vehicle. Um, well, anyway, so no, I, I'll, I would just elaborate on that a little bit. Cause it, you know, it's, you know, we've always kind of run into the issue that, that you brought up of it's, it's the same thing with a different skin. Um, right. and it's not necessarily teach anything new. Um, and you know, yeah. How you, how you apply that kind of idea of, Hey, take something that's old, but fresh and go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Um, is where at least I would particularly be interested in, in some of that training, you know, like if you're doing a vehicle course, you know, let's say we've got the, the vehicle modeling course that's, that's done and you're able to, you know, create the vehicle from scratch. Well, what's the next step of that? You know, where, where does a course apply that you could, you could go beyond just the original vehicle? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's a very, it's a very open-ended question, yeah. but definitely like, like, I think your, your workshop was great because that's exactly what it was. It was, mm -hmm. Hey, we're not teaching, we're not teaching the same thing over and over again. Yeah. But now, cool. What's you know? What's the origin of your character? You know, what goes into this design and the ability to start focusing on some of those, you know, less. Um, I guess less. Uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, less inorganic courses, and in that, like, you know, like when you're teaching when you're teaching a beginner course, it's very much cool. You need to do this. You need to do this. Mm -hmm. Here's how this works. Here's how this works. But once you start getting into advanced subjects, it's it's much more organic. It's much. Um, it's where you can really start having the creative process yes. as opposed to just the technical process. Right. Uh, and that's something that we've not been able to do as much, mm -hmm. you know, let, how do you focus on the creative expression versus yes. just the execution? Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. That's, that's a, that's a great way to put it. Um, and I, I can see in people like I get a huge kick out of when they take my, my robot course for any of course, for example, the Piero course, and then they post, progress and it's a totally different bird or it's yeah. a totally different oh, robot awesome. because that to me is like you're you're getting what i'm trying to teach you you're not just pressing the same buttons and mm -hmm. you know like recreating what i'm telling you to um well and that's and that's tough because like obviously that's what we you know we always want people to do but teaching teaching the ability to you know apply what you've learned versus copy what you've learned is Wow. Man, if anybody ever figures that out, yeah. let us know. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Wow. Um, okay, so a couple other questions. Um, what, I've seen a few comments about Python scripting um, for artists, and uh, that's absolutely something that we can teach more of. We have a course from Bartek, uh, not Bartek. Um, um, Bassam Kardali. Yeah, yeah, Bassam. That I mean, he is he's incredible with that kind of thing. So we've got we've dipped our toe in that pool, but um, I know that I, I I had the moment when I realized how important scripting could be to an artist, and I would love to to teach that because it's not from the technical side; it's it's just from a purely artistic side. So I do think there's room for that. Um, now, just well, fitting that there's... into where and when, and that's totally. the question. But we would love to. And I think certainly. I think there's a lot of room for you know, what are traditionally technical only topics like that in the context of an artist, mm -hmm. you know, I think you and I, you can probably agree with me here that, you know, for the longest time, programming was very much like it was, it was a mystery. It's like, I don't need to know programming. Yeah. I'm an artist. Like I, I make everything. Right. I don't need to learn scripting and all that kind of stuff. Right. Like what the heck's a variable? <laughs> no, I just made my objects. Yep. And getting, I think getting over that like mental block mm -hmm. is, is really hard for a lot of people. Yeah, uh, sure. and I don't think I don't think it has anything to do with you know personal stubbornness or anything like that. I think it's just that you know for the longest time they were programmers and they were artists. Mm -hmm. That's not the case anymore. Right. You know, it's very much artists can absolutely use programming as a tool in their tool bag, just like any other tool. Be that sculpting, be that mesh modeling, be that materials. It is incredibly empowering. Yes, uh, and 
if you want to like if you want to learn scripting, it doesn't mean that you have to learn scripting so that you can recreate Topoflow or something like that. Like mm-hmm. that's a whole other level. Yeah. But being able to use it for you know creation and replication and automation and oh, yeah. all of those things, it's ah, oh, so em- helpful. Empowering. That is the perfect word for it. Wow, I felt like a I felt you know like a strong man when I learned how to do that. <laughs> Um, Don't uh, let anybody tell you otherwise, King. You are a very strong man. Oh, well, I mean, I got muscles on my muscles, sure. <laughs> um, so from Bartos P. Pilat, um, I love our international uh, user base. I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, more So more ab- abstract things like design and game art, overall production would be nice. So not an actual question. Just a, Yeah, but that, I think that's a, but that's a great addition to like what we were talking about in terms of, you know, we, we had... We, we originally just had kind of just a myriad of topics of all mm-hmm. different difficulties. And then we moved our focus to the beginners and we're slowly building up off that foundation. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel like that's kind of where we're getting to now is we can start being more abstract uh, and focusing on, you know, uh, not just the, you know, the steps of how you do something, but then um, I guess the, the overall umbrella of yeah how you, how you do all the things. Yeah. I, don't know. Oh, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but uh, no, you're right. You know, whether that it's working in a production environment, whether that is, you know, if you're going to start a game project, y- you know, it's not just as simple as creating a bunch of assets and stick them in the game. Yeah. It, you know, what goes into actually doing a full game? What right. that goes into designing that production and managing the art and yeah, uh, all of it. You're for absolutely sure. right. Um, that I'm glad you asked that because specifically with game art, um, our team, our content team is. We uh, sent out a poll and there, it was overwhelming among our users that they wanted uh, game direction. That was the big interest. And so um, that was exciting to us because, um, well, for, one, for a couple of reasons, but like one of them was that we needed to figure some of that out on our own. Like Gonzo has been doing game stuff for, for years. That's his focus. Um, that's Jonathan Gonzalez. We call him Gonzo. Um, I have taken classes at school about, about, uh, uh, game production, but never been involved in a project. And then Lampel is a similar to me. So um, we are going through that process right now and realizing, you know, like how important a game design document is. Like you can't just sit down and start modeling stuff. Even if you have all those ideas, you need to think about the production, like what software to use to organize those things. So all that is very fresh and we're learning that um, very in- intently um, right now. So that stuff is definitely coming. Um, we're just trying to learn yeah, it ourselves awesome and when it comes. give you some yeah. good info yeah it should be really awesome but um cool well we're coming up on i mean we can probably end <laughs> pretty soon i think i blocked out <coughs> oh, an hour and a half sorry. um so we got about 15 more minutes but if you have any other questions please ask them we'll get to those in these uh, in the last uh, half or quarter of an hour i guess um yeah, that's but good. i mean that's pretty much all i had on my list to ask and talk to you about I do have a, I see a question in the chat that actually I really want to answer. Oh, perfect. I think yeah. it's a really important one. Um, so Sazabi404 said, I love Blender, but it is hard for me to find work where they don't say I should use 3ds Max or Maya. I want to use Blender. Where can I make, or I want to use Blender where I can make my best. So should I be an independent artist or do freelancing jobs or any advice? Um, Great question. I mean, a couple of comments, yeah. I think that this has been... This was an issue when I started at like uh, tw- 12 years ago, mm-hmm. even 14 years ago, uh, like when I started uh, doing professional work, is people have a certain expectation within, I'll, I will say within the industry, even though I hate that phrase. <laughs> um, uh, many people have an, an expectation of what goes into 3D and how you do 3D, even if they're not the ones doing it. So the first thing that I would say is if you're doing, if you're looking for jobs, um, particularly say freelance jobs online and they say, cool, you know, if you can give us a max file or if you use 3ds max, that's great. First things first, if they are the end client, like if they're not a production studio or even if they are in some cases, the vast majority of times they could care less about what you actually use to create it. So long as you give it to them in a format that will just work within their pipeline. So for example, if you're doing a contract gig for a production studio that uses 3ds Max in-house and they need you to model, you know, um, 10 different cars. Cool, get model those cars in Blender wherever you want and then just 
you know, ask the right questions to see what do they need in the final delivery? Do they need just a mesh that they can then just import? In which case, cool, give them, a, give them an OBJ. Um, do they need a full Max file with materials already configured? Find a friend that has Max, um, you know, uh, or, or depending on, depending on the usage, um, you may even be able to use student copies, although that's typically, typically most student copies um, are not allowed to be used for commercial purposes. Um, but basically just understand what the final delivery is because the vast, vast majority of the time, they don't care. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like asking a photographer, Hey, I need these photos for me, but be sure that you use a Canon as opposed to a Nikon. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really matter at the end, you know, it's just a tool. And right. so like, I mean, I know when I was freelancing a lot, I did a lot of modeling projects specifically, uh, that the end client was using max. And so then I would just give them an, o an OBJ file. They would import it in and no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, all they need is the model. They don't necessarily, you know, they don't care about your scene setup. They don't care about your presets or anything like that. Because number one, they already have their own. They already have their own configuration. And they would rather that they could be able to pull in your assets without messing up their configuration than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, most of the time, it really does not matter. The one exception to that is if you're working deep within a production pipeline, say, for example, you're working on a, a feature film and you're doing all the compositing. Obviously, you're in the bigger the project, the more people involved and the more specialized the tools become. And so if you have a lot of interchange where you're working on somebody else's file and then you're sending that file off to somebody else, you're not going to have the flexibility there. But as an independent artist doing freelance work, particularly, particularly if you're doing smaller jobs, vast majority of the time, does not matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, what I would tell you as advice, Sazabi, is just apply, just do it. Uh, and don't even bring that up as a question unless it's made abundantly clear that it's going to become an issue. Because if you give them a deliverable and they don't know what you used, does not matter. Mm -hmm. um, I know for a fact, I did a couple of jobs where they I think they asked for a particular format and I know that had I said that I use Blender, they would have dismissed me and not, I wouldn't have gotten the work. But when I delivered the work, I'm like, cool, sweet, thanks. See you again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Has that been your experience too, Kent? And that it really just doesn't matter most of the time? Yeah, um, especially with my freelance experience, it rarely has been a showstopper for, for anybody. Um, and, and then in my studio experience, it, you hit on it that like deep in a production pipeline, it can be, it can be a problem. Uh, I worked as a, a modeler at a studio and when I joined, I, I used all their tools cause I was just happy to be there. And I'm like, you know, I'll do whatever you want. But then once I got comfortable, I, I adopted blender and I, I figured out, I knew the pipeline there and could carve out how to use blender, um, there. And it was actually kind of fun. I, I got a kick out of it. Anytime the studio network went down, everybody's professional licenses stop working. So everybody just stands up like, well, we can't do anything. And so they like walk to 7-Eleven and I'm still working. I'm still doing my thing. So in a way <laughs> I missed out on a nice break. But uh, anyway, um, some benefits to Blender. But as a modeler, if a studio says you can't use Blender as a modeler, I, I wouldn't want to work there. That's such a level of ignorance in my opinion. There's no reason yeah. why you can't model anywhere with any yeah, package. Totally agree. Um, but once you get into some like rigging and, and animation, more technical, deep pipeline stuff, yeah, it can be a problem. The only other thing I'll say about that is, is when you're applying for a job, it's not, I would say it's not the time to like die on the hill of your blender idealism either. Like no. figure out how to learn some of those other softwares. I mean, it's not going to hurt you. You know, like I know when you're on your own, there's like, it'll make you a better artist. Yeah. Oh, always a better artist for learning how to do other software, which is something we would like to teach as well in the near future, like how to translate your skills between software. Cause it, it's all about the skills more than the software, yeah, but it really is. Well, and you know, if you, we all, we all particularly here love blender. Um, you yeah. know, we, we built our business predominantly on blender. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my own personal success is absolutely built on Blender. But at the end of the day, you have to remember that it's just a tool. Like so far as your your work output goes, right. it's just a tool. Blender is special because of the community and everything else around it. It's not the tool set that makes it special. Yeah. Um, and so if, you know, if your financial independence is 
being sacrificed because you refuse to use another tool, that's arrogance and er ignorance. Yeah. Um, because there's nothing that says that you can't use whatever tool is needed to do the job and then come back to Blender and find other ways to use it for your own satisfaction. Yeah. Or like, like you said, Kent, as, as you got comfortable within the studio pipeline, you started using Blender for more and more of your studio pipeline work because right. you figured out how you could fit it in. Um, I know there's plenty of artists in Hollywood that do exactly that. Mm -hmm. They even work deeply within those integrated pipelines True. and keep sneaking Blender in, uh, <laughs> in part because they know the pipeline well enough that they can. Right. Um, yeah, that's a and there's, great there's point. a lot of people doing that. Yeah. Um, but I would just echo what you said. Don't don't die on your sword just so that you can use it. Uh, right. right. Absolutely. A tool is a tool. And, you know, just because you have to use something else for another job does not mean you can't come back to the Blender community. Uh, case in point, some of the, the last commercial work that we did, because um, actually, um, CG Cookie used to have a production studio um, or studio oh, yeah. of sorts. Forget that. And that we had kind of a, a production wing of CG Cookie where we would do production work for clients. And one of the one of the last projects that we did was very heavily 3ds Max. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, all the final output was done in Max, but most of the modeling was done in Blender. And so we just use both of them yeah, uh, and it, it works. Right. They don't have to be big enemies, different software. Certainly yeah, not. totally. Uh, uh, well, and particularly on the user side of things. Right. Uh, you know, there's, there's so much tribalism that goes into it that maybe every now and then it's okay to, you know, maybe I should get a taste of this. Just if anything, broaden the horizon. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, That's very valuable. And Omar kind of um, uh, corroborated that idea. Um, totally. Cool. Um, Let's see. Oh, I had, I thought I saw, you saw another question. Oh, yeah. Um, I, uh, Ives Pereira. I, Oh, it's I always Eve. wondered if I pronounced it Ives or Eves. It's Eve without the S. I remember that from my oh. last stream. Okay. Um, that's very good to know because I see your name a lot cause yeah. you're awesome. Uh, but, uh, Eve asked, how do you plan on adapting to Blender 2.8? I mean, the UI will be revisited in depth, and I wonder how you are going to adapt your tutorials and the already existing content of the site to that. Uh, welcome to the problem of running a training site based on software that changes every single year. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Ken, I, I, I think you're actually more more right. apt to answer that one as the, the content lead and primary author now. Right, well, funny enough, Jonathan here is kind of a saboteur because he is working with that team, changing hotkeys and all kind of stuff. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, it's good. Ultimately, ultimately, it's going to be good for every everything, I believe. Um, and we're going to have to revisit a lot of training. We are going to try and hit it very hard, very quickly. You know, not dissimilar to the 2.5 push. Um, and... I've not thought about it a ton just because I, I don't, I don't see much beyond we're gonna have to redo a lot, and uh, that could be a good a good moment to completely revamp our fundamentals, and uh, because once you get beyond fundamentals, especially um, I think it doesn't matter if you're watching a twenty year old tutorial or or cutting edge today, like you're getting you understand that you're getting the meat, not the button clicks. And so yeah. at least the fundamentals we'll need to address for the 2.8 switch, yeah. which is exciting, you know? Which, is, which is still no no small endeavor because there's a lot of fundamentals. And, yeah, you know, yeah, there will be a decent chunk that won't really be that impacted, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them will. And, yeah, it'll be a lot of work. Yeah, but it will be. I guess that's, that's what we get for running a, a training company. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Cool, man. Well, we just have a couple minutes left. Do you want to hang around if anyone has questions? Just a couple sure. more minutes to ask them. But I mean, I'm, I'm in my office already, so I'm not going anywhere. Oh, yeah. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Um, I do. I think this might not be enough time, but maybe I would be interested in your like free and open source ideology and how that how you enter into that blender having such a strong free and open source, you know, flag, um, and how that can, it can create some weird space, especially like running a business, running a marketplace, uh, using it professionally. Like, you know, we just saw, um, um, oh, the guy, HDR, HDRI Haven. Greg Zoll. Greg Zoll. Yeah. He just, he yeah. just made everything free, free on his site. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, 
you know, like where, where, where do you land with the free and open source? Is it like the be all end all as it seems for some people? Um, I think I have a fairly pragmatic approach to it in that, or I admit, maybe I'm not using that word correctly. Um, I, Sound good. It's not, it's not an idealistic thing to me. I, mm -hmm. I find it to be a very, very practical thing mm -hmm. to open source it. Um, I think with, I, I forget what the, the rule is called, but basically within technology, everything doubles every one to two years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, be that be that our programming practices, be that our web development tools, be our 3D tools, really doesn't matter. The, the pace of technology is incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. um, and to to try and, you know, say, oh, these are our proprietary secrets and nobody else can use them, I think it's just, it's bullshit, personally. <laughs> yeah, um, I love it. I, certainly there are cases where, you know, proprietary, well, let's, let's talk about specifically about, you know, coding um there are cases where proprietary code is is important um you know whether for a security reason or for privacy reasons or or you name it i mean yeah, like for, for example like apple has a lar large um stake in this on their privacy aspect where you know they're basically betting their business alone on privacy where nobody outside of apple knows exactly how all of their data is is uh protected mm -hmm. for good and bad reasons and the practical side of me says that that even many of those parts should perhaps be open source for the sake of letting you know additional eyes to help make it even more secure now mm -hmm. some of that of course is is ignorant speaking because i don't know the second thing about you know, high level um, data security and whatnot. But just as an example, um, like let's let's apply it to, to Blender add-ons. That's a much simpler thing that we can we can look at. There, when you release a tool for for Blender, there's nothing proprietary about it. Um, sure, you spent the time to figure out how to you know execute it and present it in a usable manner. But what are you going to gain? by keeping everything proprietary. Number one, you can't legally. Um, oh, I think my video just, oh, never mind. It just I'm sorry, out on I messed that. up. Yep. Um, there's, you don't gain anything from keeping it secret, in my opinion, particularly on a small project using a niche audience. Um, but additionally, you can't legally mm -hmm. because it's all GPL. So there's that. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I realize I'm not, I'm not doing a very good job of answering that question. Um, but it's, it, to me, it's, it's a practical thing. Mm -hmm let let the community as a whole help improve the code base rather than just you yeah you know all of us are smarter than one of us right uh, yeah maybe that maybe that's not a very good analogy be it but to me that's the the gist of it no. and the other thing is it's the other part is like look look at the movie industry how how hard they have worked for drm to mm -hmm. stop people from pirating their content. And, and guess what's the number one thing that has worked to prevent piracy? Easy access and distribution. You know, Netflix, I guarantee you, has done more for stopping piracy than any DRM effort ever has and ever will. Wow. Because you make it easy to access and people don't mind paying for it. Does that, is that going to stop piracy? Of course not. Yeah. You're, you're not going to stop piracy. Right, right. Uh, and so I think there's a, you know, if you're, if you're basing your business on keeping keeping secrets and limiting the distribution of something, I think you are doomed to fail. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, embrace it. That um, that's um, a pretty big topic. Maybe we can devote even a, another stream or blog to it. But I, I like yeah. your perspective because you're somewhere in the middle where like you released Retopoflow, like it's GPL and like people can go download it on GitHub. Um, mm -hmm. So like you stand behind the words you just said. But you're also not the type, some people can take that to the extreme, a lot of people I feel like in the Blender community, that anything you touch with Blender, and maybe outside of Blender, like should be free, that should go to everyone, <laughs> as if time uh, doesn't cost something, you know, you, you're see, not that. See, now, now there, that's that's the topic that we should talk a lot about. <laughs> okay, all right, definitely let's put a pin in that. Um, 
Well, well I, I don't mean to, to stop and extract, but simply that that it, it's been such a core topic, you know. Okay, that discussion of basically should the things that you do around Blender be distributed for free because Blender is free? Um, that question or argument and stance has been going on since 2003, at least, uh, because I, I distinctly... Uh, I distinctly remember getting called out multiple times for selling training DVDs that I had put a lot of time into making because how dare I sell something that was made with Blender when Blender is free. Right. Like, huh? <laughs> okay, my time's not worth anything, I guess. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's a, that's a big topic for sure. Yeah. Uh, oh, my word. I, I, I would say that I have spent the better part of my professional career fighting exactly that stance. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. A good what fight. It, I'm, I'm on board with that. What it completely misses is it misses the value of time. Mm -hmm. And that's complete opposite of, of the non-open source stance. You know, if you're going to take the stance to say that, hey, all of this work should be proprietary because we are, um, we are protecting company secrets. We are mm -hmm. protecting whatever. That's putting the value on the technology. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're selling a service or a product that you know, you're not, you're not locking it down. You're not, you know, in, you're not locking the doors in any way. Mm -hmm. You're putting the value on time. Yeah. And to me, that's the big difference. Are you valuing somebody's time and the work that they put into it? Or are you valuing exclusively the output of that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's so. well said, I, I think. <laughs> Um, okay, so just a couple more things, and then we'll wrap up. I do want to, yeah. you to answer one question because I'm curious okay. myself. But um, so, are there any? Uh, this is from Tibbs. What would be your tips to quickly progress um, transition from Blender to another software? Um, I, I, if I, I'll go ahead and answer that. If cool. I would say quickly is the problem with that question. Um, mm -hmm. There's I, I can't think of a single way other than. Like, well, someone said, uh, Bartos said, like, just get in there and do it. You have to f just figure out where is, what is this tool called in this other program? What, where are these menus? You just have to get in there and do it. And it's frustrating. It's never easy until you have to do it again and then do it again. Um, each time you learn a new software, it does get easier. But we're going to try and make a course to fast track some of those, mm -hmm. the translational things. Um Another question is, is there any plans to incorporate Godot, I think is how you pronounce that, oh. open source game dev? And uh, there, Yeah, you, they, you can answer that. That's, that's your realm. Yeah, not not at the moment. We are talking, we've, we've talked a little bit about Unreal, like incorporating that given its popularity and, and high standing in the game dev community. Um, we haven't talked about Godot being the open source one. I just looked it up maybe a couple weeks ago and... Um, it didn't thrill me, but um, you know, now it's on my radar a little bit more that it's because it's on yours. So we'll certainly look into that. Um, and then the last question that I, I'm curious for Jay is um, Omar asks, I get a sense that you like technology. Do you have any gadgets that you love and that make your life easier that you could recommend? I think that's a fun question. That is a fun question. Um, and I think my answer today is probably very different than it would have been a few years ago. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about that. Yeah, well, so I, I mean, growing up and like all through college, like I was absolutely obsessed with technology. Um, <laughs> you know, I was the guy that wanted to, you know, code uh, or build build sensors all throughout my room so I could know when doors were open. Not because I cared about security, but I just thought it was fun. Um, I thought it was really cool. I mean, granted, there was even though I never did it, I always really wanted to build. Um, basically a bunch of prankster devices. Like there's the classic one of, you know, you add a, put a, put a bucket of water on your door and someone, somebody opens it, it dumps it on them. I always <laughs> wanted to automate that to say, cool, why don't I put this on a light sensor? And, um, cause I spent a lot of times working with, with Lego Mindstorms. And so that was the part that like, I loved building robots and things like that. Right. Um, I never did any of that stuff. Like I never, never pulled any pranks via technology. I was, I don't know. Maybe you don't seem like nice. the prankster type um, to me. That's interesting. No, but it always sounded like fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have very good follow through. I just always wanted to do it. Uh, uh, in recent years, I, I changed a little bit. Um, 
you know, I used to I used to follow every single video card release religiously. I mm. followed every single Apple release religiously. I followed you know all the new. Basically, if it was a gadget, I was interested and intrigued, and I was following it. Mm -hmm. um, and it was about the same time that I I stopped doing training. That I basically I don't want to say I stopped caring about gadgets um, or technology in general, but I I like consciously kind of set them aside in that I I needed space for myself. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that I don't still use gadgets in every part of my life. Um, I love my watch. I love the 3D printer behind me. <laughs> um, I still work on multiple computers. I work with two displays. I love technology. But I've started just having technology as a part of what I do, as opposed to being like infatuated with it. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as actually the to actually answer Omar's question, the the one thing that I absolutely love is my watch. Um, hmm. specifically for the activity tracking, uh, wow. you know, and it doesn't have to be a, an Apple watch. It could be the Garmin watch. It could be, you know, any of the, the many that are available now. Um, I've been trying to be really health conscious over the last few years and try and be a lot more active. And so having, having that instantly at hand to know like, Oh, I haven't moved all day today. Okay. <laughs> let's go for a run. Uh, that's really, really helpful, particularly because I'm one of those people that like, even though I have to eat like every three hours, um, cause I have a ridiculous metabolism, <laughs> I will get so focused on something that I will forget to eat. And then I will kind of step back and I will just about pass out because I'm like, Oh crap, I gotta go eat. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's really nice. That, that's, that's a good one. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm a bit of, we won't go into this, but I'm a bit of the skeptic of the watch, but now that you're, you've said that. I um, would. I really was for a long time. You were? Uh, okay. I am no longer skeptic on it. Uh, Man. Yeah. Well, VR did that to me this past week, made a believer yeah. out of me. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Okay. I, I might amend my answer. <laughs> the the HTC Vive is really freaking cool. Yes. Uh, I was so skeptical of it. <laughs> no, it's it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> really? I, I totally I want one now. Um, <laughs> I want to build. I don't know. I, could put, I, could, I have enough room here in the office that I could put one in. Uh, oh yeah. So somehow or other, I think I'm gonna have to find. See your productivity go. Beep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I don't see any more questions. That's a good time to wrap it up. Um, Sounds good. But thank you so much for for doing this. Uh, Absolutely. I just want to say fun. it's an honor for me to work with Jay. I look up to him. I learned so much from him, and it's just, he. It's a great part of working at this company. So, thank you, sir. Luck, and thank uh, you so much. everyone else, have a great rest of your. Thursday, and then a, a weekend coming up. Thanks for watching, everyone. Talk to you later. Adios.